In the spirit of the trans-individual ontology that animates anarcho-feminism, this talk will be performed by a chorus of anonymous philosophers. One, why anarcho-feminism? It has become something of a commonplace to argue that in order to fight the oppression of women, it is necessary to unpack the ways in which different forms of oppression intersect with one another. No single factor, be it nature or nurture, economic exploitation or cultural domination can be said to be the single cause sufficient to explain the multifaceted sources of patriarchy and sexism. Intersectionality has consequently become the guiding principle for an increasing number of left-wing feminists, both from the global north and from the global south. As a result, there is hardly any publication in the field today that does not engage with the concept of intersectionality, whether to promote it, to criticize it, or simply to position oneself with regards to it. Yet, strikingly enough, in all this, there is barely any mention of the feminist tradition of the past that has been claiming exactly the same point for a very long time. Anarchist feminism, or as I prefer to call it, anarcha-feminism, the latter term has been introduced by social movements trying to feminize the concept and thereby give vis visibility to a specifically feminist strand within the anarchist theory and practice. This anarcha feminist tradition, which has largely been neglected both in academia and in public debate more in general, has a particularly vital contribution to offer today. To begin with, together with queer theory, path-breaking work aimed at dismantling the gender binary men and women, I think it is important to vindicate once again the need for a form of feminism that opposes the oppression of people who are perceived as women and who are discriminated precisely on that basis. Notice here that I'm using the term woman in a way that includes all types of women, female women, feminine women, masculine women, lesbian women, trans women, intersex women, queer women, and so on and so forth. Despite the alleged equality of formal rights, women are still objects of consistent discrimination and the advancement of gay or queer rights can be accompanied by retrogress on women's battles that we thought had been won once and for all. Think here of the right to abortion, to equal pay for equal work. Far from being an issue of the past, feminism is therefore more imperative than ever. Yet it must be supported by an articulation of women's liberation that does not create further hierarchies and this is precisely where anarcho-feminism can intervene. While other feminists from the left have been tempted to explain the oppression of women on the basis of a single factor, anarchists have always been crystal clear in arguing that in order to fight pa patriarchy, we have to fight the multifaceted ways in which multiple factors, economic, cultural, racial, political, converge to foster it. This neglect, if not outright historical amnesia, of an important leftist tradition is certainly the result of the ban that anarchism suffered within academia in particular and within public debates in general, where anarchism has most often been misleadingly portrayed as a mere call to violence and disorder. Yet this is a ban that happened to the detriment of historical accuracy, global inclusiveness, and political efficacy. My proposal is to remedy such a gap by formulating a specific anarcho-feminism approach adapted to the challenges of our time. The point is not simply to give visibility to an anarcho-feminism tradition, which has been an, impor an important component within past women's struggles, and thereby reestablish some historical continuity. Besides historical accuracy, recovering anarcho-feminist insights has the crucial function of enlarging feminist strategies, precisely in a moment when, as intersectional feminists have argued, different factors increasingly converge to intensify the oppression of women by creating further class, cultural, and racial cleavages among them. At a time when feminism has been accused of being mere white privilege, this task is more crucial than ever. The emancipation of women from the global north can indeed happen at the expenses of further oppression of women from the global south, who most often replace them in the reproductive labor within the household. It is precisely when we adopt such a global perspective, all the more necessary today because of the increased mobility of capital and labor forces, that the chain linking gendered labor across the globe becomes apparent 
and the timeliness of anarcho-feminism all the more evident. We need a more multifaceted approach to domination, in particular, one able to incorporate different factors as well as the different voices coming from all over the globe. As Chinese anarcho-feminist Henze wrote at the dawn of the 20th century in the problems of women's liberation, quote, the majority of women are already oppressed by both the government and by men. The electoral system simply increases their oppression by introducing a third ruling group, elite women. Even if the oppression remains the same, the majority of women are still taken advantage of by the minority of women. When a few women in power dominate the majority of powerless women, an equal class differentiation is brought into existence among women. If the majority of women do not want to be controlled by men, why do they want to be controlled by women? Therefore, instead of competing with men for power, women should strive for overthrowing men's rule. Once men are stripped of the privilege of their privilege, they they will become the equal of women. There will be no submissive women, nor submissive men. This is the liberation of women. End quote. The timeliness, the timeliness of these words written in 1907 shows how prophetic anarcho-feminism has been. And here also comes the answer to our question. Why anarcho-feminism? Because it is the best antidote against the possibility of feminism becoming simply white privilege. In an epoch when the election of a single woman as a president is presented as liberation of all women, or when women, or when women such as Ivana, Ivanka Trump can claim feminist battles of the past by transforming the hashtag woman who work into a tool to sell a fashion brand, the fundamental message of anarcho-feminism of the past is more urgent than ever. Quote, feminism does not mean female corporate power or a woman president. It means no corporate power and no president, end quote. Two, why feminism and why women? At this point, one may object. Why insist on the concept of feminism and not just call this anarchism? Why focus just on women? If the purpose is to dismantle all types of oppressive hierarchies, should we not also get rid of the gender binary which opposes women to men and thus also imprisons us in a heteronormative matrix? We should be immediately clear that when we say women, we are not speaking about some supposed object, about an eternal essence, or even less so, about a pre-given object. Indeed, to articulate a specifically feminist position while maintaining a multifaceted understanding of domination, we need a more nuanced understanding of womanhood. By drawing insights from a Spinozist ontology of the trans individual, I argue that bodies in general, and women's bodies in particular, must not be considered as individuals, as objects given once and for all, but rather as processes. Women's bodies, like all bodies, are bodies in plural because they are processes. Processes that are con constituted by mechanisms of affects and associations that occur at the inter, intra, and supra-individual level. To give just a brief example of what I mean here, think of how our bodies come into being through an inter-individual encounter. How they are shaped by supra-individual forces, such as their geographical locations, and how they're made up by intra-individual bodies, such as the air we breathe or the food we eat. Only if women's bodies are theorized as processes, as sites of a process bec of becoming that takes place at different levels, only then will we be able to speak about women without incurring the charge of essentialism or culturalism. If we adopt this trans individual ontology, we can also use the concept of women woman outside of any heteronormative framework and thus use the term in such a way that it comes to include all types of women, feminine women, female women, masculine women, male women, lesbian women, bisexual women, intersex women, trans women, cis women, asexual women, queer women, so on and so forth. In sum, all those bodies that identify themselves and are identified through the always changing narrative of womanhood. To sum up on this point, this trans individual understanding allows us to articulate the question, what does it mean to be a woman in pluralistic terms while also defending a specifically feminist form of anarchism? 
Developing this concept of woman as open processes also means going beyond the individual versus collectivity dichotomy. If it is true that all bodies are trans individual processes, then the assumption that there could be such a thing as a pure individual who is separate or even opposed to a given collectivity is at best a useless abstraction and at worst a deceitful fantasy. Three, which women and which anarcho-feminism? So if anarcho-feminism is a lens, what should be the framework for such an enterprise? Adopting an anarcho-feminist lens also means taking the entire globe as a framework for thinking about the liberation of women. This implies going beyond any form of methodological nationalism, that is, privileging certain women and thus certain national re uh, regional contexts. If fighting the oppression of women means we have to fight all forms of oppression, then statism and nationalism cannot be any exception. If one begins by looking at the dynamics of exploitation by taking state boundaries as an unquestionable fact, one will automatically end up reinforcing the very oppression that one was meant to question in the first place. Put in a slogan, we could say, the globe first, because the framework is the message and adopting anything less than the entire globe as our framework is at best naive provincialism and at worst obnoxious ethnocentrism. Whereas several feminist theories, theories produced in the global north have failed to understand the, con understand the extent to which the emancipation of white middle class women happened at the expense of a renewed oppression of the working class racialized bodies, anarcho-feminists anarcho have traditionally adopted a more inclusive perspective. It is not a coincidence that most anarchist theorists from Kropotkin to Reclu have been geographers and or anthropologists. By exploring the processes of production and reproduction of life independent of state boundaries and on a planetary scale, these authors not only were able to avoid the pitfalls of any methodological nationalism, but could also perceive the global interconnectedness of forms of domination, beginning with the intertwinement of capitalist exploitation and colonial domination. This is not just a remark about theorists, such a global framework has been very well present among activists as well, not only in the global north, but also in the global south. For example, different anarcho-feminist programs in Latin America have taken the common property of the globe as their starting point for political action, bypassing any sense of national belonging and often emphasizing the racialized dimension of women's oppression. Four. The col coloniality of gender, another woman is possible. If we take the globe as our framework, the first striking datum emerging is that people across the globe have not always been doing gender. And moreover, even if they did do it, they did it in very different terms. It is only with the emergence of a worldwide capitalist system that the gender binary, men versus women, became hegemonic worldwide. This does not mean that sexual difference did not exist before capitalism. It simply means that binary gender roles were not as universally accepted as the primary criteria by which to classify bodies. Modern capitalism made the mononuclear bourgeois family with its binary gender roles hegemonic. Marxist feminists have long since been emphasizing how capitalism needs a gender division of labor because being predicated on the endless expression of profit, endless expansion of profit, it needs both the extraction of surplus value from wage productive labor, as well as unpaid reproductive labor, which is still performed largely by gendered bodies. Put bluntly, capitalism needs women because it needs the assumption that women are not working <coughs> when they wash their husbands and children's socks. They are just performing their reproductive function and thus fulfilling their very nature. As Maria Mies, among others, emphasized, perceiving women's labor not as proper work, but as simply the result of their gender is pivotal to keeping the division between wage labor, subject to exploitation, and unwaged labor, subject to what she called super exploitation. This form of gendered exploitation is super 
because whereas the exploitation of wage labor takes place through the extraction of surplus value, that of women's domestic labor takes place via denial, the very status of work. By building on these types of insights, Maria Lugones has recently put forward the very useful concept of the coloniality of gender. With this move, she aims to emphasize how the binary division, men, women, and the classification of bodies according to their racial belonging went together, being exported by Europeans through the very process of colonial expansion that accompanied the worldwide spread of capitalism. Within the American context, Lugones showed how the gender roles were much more flexible and variegated among Native Americans before the advent of European settlers. Different indigenous nations had, for instance, a third gender category to positively recognize intersex and queer subjectivities, whereas others, such as the Yuma, attribute gender roles on the basis of dreams, so that a female who dreamed of weapons became a male for all practical purposes. There has been a systematic entwinement, intertwinement among capitalist economy, racial classification of bodies, and gender oppression. It is manifest and yet all too often forgotten that to classify people on the basis of their skin color or their genitalia is not an a priori of human mind. Classifying bodies on the basis of their sex, as well as classifying them on the basis of their race, implies, among other things, a primacy of the visual register. Such a primacy, according to Oye Ronke Oye Yumi, is typical of the West, particularly when looked at from the perspective of some African pre-colonial cultures. As she points out in her seminal, The Invention of Women, the Oyo Yoruba cultures, for instance, relied much more on the oral transmission of information than on its visualization. And they valued age over all other criteria for social hegemony. They did not even have a name to oppose men and women before colonialism. Put bluntly, they simply did not do gender. Therefore, questioning the coloniality of gender means also questioning the primacy of the visual. It is by seeing bodies that we say, here's a woman, and that is a man. But it is also within such a visual register that we have to operate to question such hegemonic and heteronormative views of womanhood, and thus open new paths towards subverting them. Put in a slogan, we could say, another woman is possible. Another woman has always already began. Five, an ongoing manifesto. These words, another woman is possible, another woman has always already begun, could indeed be the starting point for a new anarcha-feminist manifesto. In contrast to other manifestos, the latter would inevitably have to be open and ongoing, as ongoing as the trans-individual ontology that sustains it. Start, starting with Enrico Malatesta's insight that anarchism is a method and thus not a program that can be given once for all, the writing of such manifesto could proceed along these three axes. First, at the beginning, was movement. Anarchism does not mean absence of order, but rather searching for a social order without an orderer. The main order of our established ways of thinking about politics is the state, because we are so accustomed to living in sovereign states, we, for instance, tend to perceive the migration of bodies across the globe as a problem. On the contrary, we should remember that whereas sovereign states are a relatively recent historical phenomenon, for most of humanity, people have lived under other types of political formations. Human beings had been migrating across Earth since the very appearance of so-called Homo sapiens. Homo sapiens is therefore also a feminine migrant, or perhaps even better, an esse migrant. Hence, the need for an anarcho-feminism beyond boundaries and beyond ethnocentrism. Second, just do it. Do not aim to seize state power or wait for the state to give you power. Just start exercising your own power right now. 
Aiming to seize the state power or asking for recognition from it means reproducing that very same power structure that needs to be questioned in the first place. This means not only think globally and act locally, it also means that freedom is within everybody's reach and can be exercised in a number of ways that are not mutually exclusive. Resist gender norms, play with them, refuse to comply, civilly disobey, boycott capitalism, and so on and so forth. These actions are not simply lifetime anarchism or individualist strategies, as some have labeled them. They are political acts per se, which can go hand in hand with larger projects, such as the increasing examples of communal living and queering the family that are proliferating around the globe. Global is the oppression, so global has to be the fight. Third, the end is the means, the means is the end. There cannot and there should not be any fully-fledged political program for an anarcho-feminist manifesto. If freedom is the end, freedom must be the means to reach it. Anarchism is a method for thinking as well as for acting, because acting is thinking and thinking is acting. In the same way in which bodies are plural and plural is the oppression, plural must also be the strategy to fight such an oppression as anarchists had been saying for a long time. Multiply your associations and be free. In other words, search for freedom in all your social relations, not simply in electoral or in institutional politics, although the latter can also be one of the levels to operate in. But if freedom is both the means and the end, then one could also envisage a world free from the very notion of gender as well as the oppressive structures that it generated. Because gender bodies are still the worldwide objects of exploitation and domination, we need an anarcho-feminist manifesto here and now. But the latter should be conceived as a ladder that we may well abandon once we have reached the top. Indeed, it is implicit in the very process of embarking in such an anarcho-feminist project that we should strive toward a world beyond the division between men and women, and thus also, in a way, beyond feminism itself. Thank you.